Hello and welcome back to Master Meteorology Advanced, the educational weather series covering the math and physics that drive weather. Our topic of the day is the horizontal momentum equation. Let's get started. So diving into my screen here, you see the governing equations of meteorology. These four equations are the horizontal momentum equation, the hydrostatic equation, the continuity equation, and the thermodynamic equation. But today, we're just going to be focused on the horizontal momentum equation. So this is the horizontal momentum equation. You get it by taking the dot product of the zonal unit vector with the momentum equation to obtain the zonal momentum equation. It's kind of a mouthful. And honestly, this equation looks pretty daunting. But what we're going to do is exactly what my teacher did. On the first day of graduate school, she put this equation up on the board and I said, wow, I've got my work cut out for me. But what she did is she first broke it down symbol by symbol. So she explained like what this U means, what this V means, rho, P, F, all those things. And then from there, once we knew all the symbols, then we dove into the terms, like looked at what's this one mean versus just that. And then once you understand all the different terms, then you can understand the overall equation. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. First, we're gonna look at the terms. Then we're going to look at this. No, first we're going to look at the symbols. Then we're going to look at the terms. Then we're going to wrap it all together and understand the entire momentum equation so that this won't look as daunting. So we're going to start by getting our axes here. The x axis is going east. So right down here, you can imagine that as like San Francisco to New York. The vertical axis, the Y is going to be northward, so like from San Francisco to Canada. And first we're going to look at what this U and what this V uh, symbols are. So U is just going to be dx dt, the change in x over time. You might, you might think that sounds familiar, it's because that's basically what velocity is, change in distance over time. So what U is, is the wind velocity, usually wind, in the eastward direction, or the zonal direction. You could probably guess what V is. It's the meridional wind, which is a fancy way of saying northward, dy dt. So it's the change in north over change in time. That's gonna be our V. So now we're gonna look at what this W is. We're gonna have that same x-axis going east, San Francisco to New York, but now our vertical axis is actually going to be vertical. It's going to be k hat z or vertical. And z is a symbol for altitude. And you can imagine this as like from San Francisco up to space. That's what this axis represents. So you see our x axis, it's or our x symbol, the u, it's still the same, dx dt, change in x over time. But now this w is going to be dz dt. So change in altitude over time. So it's that same velocity concept, but in the vertical direction. And it turns out this W is extremely important when it comes to weather and just all kinds of phenomena because vertical motion is pretty much what drives a majority of storms and uplift that creates rain and thunderstorms and tornadoes. Basically, vertical motion is the major thing we look at in meteorology because it's what creates everything that's exciting. So we're now going to look at this rho, that is density, which is also equal to mass divided by volume. Looking at this p term, that's just going to be the pressure. We're dealing with atmospheric pressure here. The SI unit for that is pascals. And something to think about is, see how this symbol is like that versus just a regular d? it actually makes a pretty big difference when you're dealing with these kinds of equations. So in this equation, you see it all looks kind of like that one. And what that is, it's a partial derivative and it's the local derivative, also called Eulerian. You'll probably hear it called that sometimes. And what this means is it's at a fixed place and you're looking at the change of some kind of variable. The, if you see d dx, this could also be called total derivative or Lagrangian, and that is following the parcel. We're not going to 
dive too much into this like right now, but it's just something to keep your eye out for that those different terms right there actually do make a difference. So you probably heard me say the term zonal when I was talking about the eastward direction. That's pretty much what it means, west to east flow. And meridional is the north to south flow. This F in here is going to be the Coriolis term, or you'll find out later, the Coriolis force. And that is equal to two omega sine phi. Now you're saying, oh my gosh, it's another equation. Well, this one's actually pretty simple. The omega right there is Earth's rate of rotation. That's just a constant, which means it's not going to change at all. It's something like seven point something, exponent something. You can look it up. But that's not going to change, so the only thing we really care about is what the latitude is. That's what this phi symbolizes here. It's the latitude in degrees. So 2 omega sine phi looks kind of complicated, but it's really just using a number that you already, I'm pretty sure, understand, which is latitude. So we've understood, hopefully, the symbols. Now we're going to look at some of the terms. So this term out on the left hand side, which is what we're solving for, is the local time rate of change of zonal wind at a fixed location. Notice it's the zonal wind, and that's because right now it's a U. Sometimes you might see that, it'd also be a V, but for right now we're just looking at the zonal wind at a fixed location. That is term one. And term two, it's actually gonna be these two put together. And the reason for that is because those are both on kind of like one plane. You could picture it, it was that like first axes we were looking at when the U and V were together. And this is called horizontal advection. So it's how much that wind speed is changing in different areas. And if you know that one is horizontal advection, and that has that W term in it, I bet you could already guess what this one's going to be. It is going to be vertical advection. Now this one here, you see the P, you remember that's pressure, rho is density, so you might have kind of an idea of what that's going to be. We found out it's going to be the pressure gradient force, and I'll put up a figure for that later so you can actually kind of picture what that is. Here, what do you think it's going to be? We got that F term, exactly, Coriolis, and I wrote Coriolis torque acting on meridional component of flow. Sounds kind of complicated, but the reason I say meridional is because, remember, in that F term, it had to do with latitude. So it has to do with if you're changing latitude. So meridional. If you're just zonal, that phi isn't going to change at all. So this F term is not going to change at all. So we wouldn't really care about it. And then this last one here, FR, I haven't talked about that one yet. That is the zonal component of the friction force. And it's the zonal component because friction always opposes the direction of flow. And from right here, you see that we're just dealing with the zonal wind for this equation. And here's the horizontal momentum equation in vector form. And you see it looks a little different, but you could probably recognize some of the these terms. You recognize that as the pressure gradient force. That one's got F, so you know it's going to have something to do with the Coriolis force and it does, and then that same friction force, and this is now acceleration. You see it's now the change in velocity over time, which is literally the definition of acceleration. Something you might not have realized though, is that this is basically just force equals mass times acceleration in disguise. It's Newton's second law. On the left hand side we have acceleration, and then on the right hand side we have force divided by mass. You might be saying, where's the mass? But it's kind of built into these different terms. They're all per unit mass. And you know their forces because this one's the pressure gradient force, this one's the Coriolis force, and this one's the friction force. So in total, we have acceleration equals forces per unit mass. Just Newton's second law for the atmosphere. And up to this point, we're still just kind of talking about different symbols and terms. So might not be that intuitive yet. Hopefully once we actually put it down into a figure, you can start to picture what these things actually mean. 
So the first thing we're going to throw into this picture is the pressure gradient force. And I like to think of this as almost just like a sloped surface and you pour some water on it, that water is always just going to flow straight down and that's pretty much what the pressure gradient force does. In this case, this is an isobar line of constant pressure of 1,005 millibars. So that one's going to be up here, this one's 1,000, it's going to be like down here. So that's going to force things just flow straight down and that's what we see. It goes from high to low pressure. That's always true for the pressure gradient force. Now we're going to put in the Coriolis force. The definition of geostrophic winds is when the pressure gradient force and Coriolis perfectly counteract each other to form a geostrophic wind. Now what the geostrophic wind is, it's basically a theoretical wind that meteorologists use to kind of describe and approximize um, different synoptic meteorology phenomena. So it's not an actual wind, but it's something that for the most part works for the real atmosphere. So it's something that you'll see a lot in equations like this and many other equations. And it turns out it's really important for the jet stream where the pressure gradient force is the strongest. You see the geostrophic wind is going to be the strongest and that's basically how we get the jet stream. I'll do a whole video on that one. But now if you're intuitive or not intuitive, but really focused on this video, you notice in this drawing, I only have the pressure gradient force in Coriolis and I left out friction. And that's why it's geostrophic versus actual. For actual winds, you have to include that friction because even though it's really small, it will still make a difference. And we'll see what that difference is in a minute. So we still have that pressure gradient force. It's flown from high to low, 1,005 to 1,000. Just gonna go straight. But what we're gonna see in actual winds instead of being parallel to the isobars like the geostrophic wind, the actual wind is going to be a little bit angled towards that lower pressure. Now the reason for this has to do with friction. When you put in friction into this figure, friction is always just going to, going to oppose the actual wind. It's gonna be in the exact opposite direction. I like to think of like an ice skater Going on ice, it's super frictionless, so they're just gonna glide right along. If that ice skater went in sand, there's gonna be a lot of friction, so they're gonna be going slower. And that's what the friction force does. It opposes the wind and makes it slower. And the Coriolis force is directly dependent on how strong that wind is. Stronger wind, stronger Coriolis. So if there's weaker wind, it's gonna be weaker Coriolis. You see that arrow got a little bit smaller, and basically what we figure out is that in this one where pressure gradient is perfectly balanced with Coriolis, in this one friction is involved, that's a small force, and it's going to weaken Coriolis. So it's no longer balanced with pressure gradient. The pressure gradient is actually going to win now. So that's going to pull this wind towards the lower pressure. And that's something that we actually see in the real atmosphere, so it's kind of cool to see these equations actually applied. Now let's go over a quick summary. When it comes to the momentum equations, we are basically just working with Newton's second law. It's force equals mass times acceleration, but it's applied to the atmosphere. So the acceleration of a parcel of air is going to depend completely just on the forces that are acting on it. We saw in that vector form of the equation, that those, the most important forces are the pressure gradient force, the Coriolis force, and the friction force. I hope this video helped. I have many more videos on the way. I'm about to film a video on the hydrostatic equation, another one of the governing equations, hopefully throw in a continuity, thermodynamic, and then we'll get into quasi-geostrophic theory. Basically what I'm doing is, whatever I learn at graduate school, I'm making videos, and then Hopefully what I learned an entire lecture, I can condense down into maybe 10, 20 minutes for you to learn. So if you want to learn more, or if you just learned anything by watching this video, subscribe to my channel so that you can learn more in the future. Thanks for watching. As a reward and thank you for watching the entire video, I'm giving you a free PDF download of the video slides so that you can go back over the material and a free PowerPoint download so that you can go through it step by step. 
You can find those resources by clicking the link in the description or by going to holthanleyweather.com. As always, if you learned something new in this video, click subscribe so that you can learn more in the future and click more videos to start that learning now. Thanks for watching.